Today's speaker, Paul Nelson, is the founding principal at Resilient Cities Catalyst, an independent nonprofit organization created to empower change in the way cities plan and act. Paul leads the organization's collaborative engagements across sectors to bring innovation and new solutions to achieve transformative impact. Paul has a background in municipal government and nonprofit organizations focusing on urban economic workforce and community development policy with an emphasis on building more cohesive and resilient communities. Prior to his current engagement, Paul led 100 Resilient Cities, a network building strategy fostering connection, community, and knowledge sharing among member cities around the world. Previously, Paul served as Assistant Commissioner in New York City's Department of Small Business Services, where he led efforts to foster economic development in, and build community in commercial districts across New York City's five boroughs. Paul has a master's degree in public administration from Robert Wagner School of Public Service at New York University and a master of arts in, and I'm going to butcher this, saint quentin yvelin in France. <laughs> and he earned a bachelor's degree of arts from Brown University. Paul's platform address today is entitled Leveraging Resilience to Foster Stronger, More Resilient Communities. Uh, urban resilience offers valuable tools and approaches that empower practitioners across all sectors from government officials to private developers to community leaders and beyond to deliver more integrated solutions for communities. Bringing these practices into our communities can unlock new ways of working together to forge stronger and more inclusive and resilient places for all. I'm very pleased to welcome Paul Nelson. Give him a hand. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I can bring my mic. Thank you. I do have a presentation that I'll be sharing today, so I'm just going to share my screen, Rob. Um, thank you so much, Esther, for the kind introduction. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you in person, um, which is a which is a gift and something we we can't take it we can't take advantage of. And you know, uh, for all of you here virtually, um, it's great to be with you as well. Um, and I have to say a special thank you to Janet Glass for the kind introduction uh, to be with you uh, here today and to share a little bit about my work with all of you. Um, I've had the, the pleasure of knowing Janet through her daughter, Jessie, for more than 25 years um, since uh, Jessie and I sang together in the choir at college. Um, so it, it's just really wonderful to be here. Um, as Esther mentioned, you know, I'm Paul Nelson. I'm, I'm one of the founders of a, a new nonprofit organization called Resilient Cities Catalyst. And we have the privilege of working with cities, communities here in the US and increasingly internationally to help them tackle some of their you know, most complex existential challenges. And that work is really rooted um, in six years of collaborative effort uh, through a Rockefeller Foundation funded initiative called 100 Resilient Cities, where as the name suggests, we uh, worked uh, in close partnership with 100 cities around the world of all different sizes, um, all different sort of political contexts and facing the, the broad range of existential risks to create a better tomorrow for the residents. And through that work, we really had the opportunity to sort of co-create a bunch of tools, approaches, frameworks that really would uh, uh, you know, allow this work to move forward. And so we're bringing those toolkits, those approaches and frameworks into our work today, not just with other cities, uh, but also with neighborhoods dedicated to sort of projects and at the regional scale as well. Um, so although I, I'm new to the Ethical Culture Society and the Ethical Culture Society of Bergen County, it's a real, you know, I'm, I'm excited to uh, be here today. And I, I know and I understand, even just from the opening words of welcome, that we kind of all come to this physical and, and virtual gathering space from diverse backgrounds, diverse professional and personal perspectives, uh, which is just, I think, a small part of what makes spaces like this really powerful. Um, and because no matter what our entry point might be to the conversation today, I think it's safe to assume that we collectively share a deep appreciation of the power of community. Uh, and at whatever scale, shape, or form that takes for us or what that means for us, I think we probably also share a commitment to building more sustainable, more equitable communities through our work. Um, and I think if the past year plus, the past two years, has really taught us anything at all, it's just brought into sharp relief that, you know, 
the context and the landscape in which we're all operating to deliver against that vision, to deliver against that shared commitment, in whatever way that means for us, is more complex than ever. And so I think it's in this environment of complexity and with a sense of urgency that the practice of resilience can offer pathways to, to new solutions that really have the potential to deliver transformational impact. So my hope for today is that I can share and unpack a little bit about what that means and what that might look like so that we can think about so how we might apply that to our personal relationships, our professional relationships, our community work, and more. I don't think uh, you know, we need to tell this group that our communities are facing an unprecedented increase in the frequency and severity of natural disasters driven by climate change, right? whether that's droughts, uh, wildfires, rain falling, coastal flooding, hurricanes. Anybody in Bergen County uh, and us down in Hudson County who experienced Ida most recently can attest to that fact, right? And I think beyond the terrible human toll that those disasters take, you know, climate change has the potential to add more than 20% or more than $100 billion annually to the cost of these events uh, every year around the world. Growing inequality from a wealth and income perspective, but also from just an opportunity access perspective, really threatens all of our prosperity. Uh, you know, as of 2019, at the end of 2019, 30% of US households, uh, that's 38 million overall, weren't making enough to make ends meet. And that's 14 million households with children, right? And due to sort of you know, the historical racial injustices and structural inequities, 47% of black households and 50% of Latino uh, and Hispanic households were in the same situation. And that was before the compounding impacts of COVID hit. Despite the recent $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, which is great. <laughs> Despite that, you know, our infrastructure, both built and natural, and on which we all rely every single day to do everything we need to do, uh, is failing to meet the needs of the 21st century. You know, our levees, our stormwater infrastructure systems, our bridges, our roads, but also social infrastructure like housing, libraries, schools, scored a dismal grade of C minus. Uh, in the latest report card for America's infrastructure. And, and the world faces a trillions upon trillions dollar gap between you know, projected investment and the amount needed to provide adequate global infrastructure by 2040. Our increasingly interconnected world brings a lot of amazing opportunity, but that same interconnectedness reveals real risks when unexpected events ripple out across the world, whether that's conflict and war, whether that's supply chain issues, or of course, the recent outbreak of COVID. Here in the US, we are grappling with and confronting centuries of systemic racism and structural inequities and its resultant challenges and engaging in a long overdue conversation about how best to forge a path forward. And of course, COVID has demonstrated to us in really terrible and visceral terms the perils and promises of the interconnected world in which we live today and the intersection of all of these interrelated challenges, starkly revealing as if we needed more evidence that certain communities among us really disproportionately bear the brunt of these compounding risks. So the question is amidst all of these challenges, right, among all these daunting uh, statistics and facts and things that we confront both day in, day out, and they can really wear on our psyche, how can we best advance our individual and collective work and practice to play a role in fostering more sustainable and equitable places for all? We believe, and I believe, that the practice of urban resilience offers a forward-thinking, sort of integrated approach to planning and acting that can help communities thrive in the face of these seemingly insurmountable risks. And I know that resilience can be fluid and mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? Depending on your local realities, what your entry point to that word is, or sort of where you are. At Resilient Cities Catalyst and through our work at 100 Resilient Cities, you know, we've had the privilege of partnering with cities all around the world to, to advance some of this work. And we found really that there are four resilience mindsets that can be leveraged and deployed no matter what sector we come from, no matter what our entry point might be, to really transform how we plan and act and how we can start to build healthier and more sustainable places for all. First, we need to take a holistic 
and honest look at the full range of risks faced by the communities we have the privilege of living in and working in and working with, both those acute disasters or shocks that can stop a community in its tracks, as well as those more insidious stresses that tear apart at communities over time. You know, shocks are those disasters that disrupt the day-to-day -day functioning of places, whether we've planned for and anticipated them, like hurricanes. We know every year that hurricane season is coming. We can watch the forecast. Or whether they are completely unexpected, as in the case of COVID. However, resilience requires us to take a hard look, not just at the shocks or disasters that strike, which often command much more attention, much more resources, much more action by government and other sectors, but as importantly, the stresses that impact the lives of, of our fellow residents on a day-to-day -day basis and are all too often ignored. You know, stresses are those chronic challenges that tear apart the fabric of our cities and communities over time. Things like chronic youth unemployment, food insecurity, you know, traffic congestion even, um, uh, crime and violence, among others. And I think the, the trick is we can't think about these collective shocks and stresses in isolation. You know, we need to consider the full range of risks our communities face in a really integrated way. Because the presence of sort of chronic stresses, these you know, underlying uh, challenges, really creates multiple vulnerabilities within communities and exacerbates the impacts of shocks when they hit. And because we can't always know which or when a shock will hit, we need to do everything we can to address the chronic stresses head on. And thinking in this integrated way allows us to do some really transformational work before something bad happens. And what that means for you know, your work is that you really have the opportunity to ground and build the vision for a program you might be working on, a project that might be, you might be advancing, a campaign you might be leading, around this interdependent web of risks, right? Not looking at them as individual separate ch challenges that need to be solved in isolation. You know, flooding that needs a flooding solution, affordable housing that needs an affordable housing solution, but rather as a network of inter interconnected risks and therefore opportunities. Linking these challenges rather than treating them in isolation and as isolated issues gives us an opportunity to tackle them at once. Secondly, I mean, just as you're thinking in an integrated way around shocks and stresses, resilience as a practice also requires thinking and acting across sectors and with a focus on bringing diverse and unlikely actors to the table to really create solutions. You know, the challenges faced by communities and the world can't be solved by a single sector alone, right? We need innovation, inspiration, and collaboration, certainly from the public sector, from government, but we need that same innovation, collaboration, and inspiration from academic institutions, from nonprofit community-based organizations, from the private sector as well. And we know this isn't easy, right? Silos among and within sectors uh, but also around particular disciplines like transportation, housing, social services, have developed it because it can seem more efficient for specialists to work together. And to be honest, funding streams coming from the public and private and philanthropic sectors also often reinforce those silos. But these silos can really prevent us from being problem-oriented and may limit our conception of some of the more innovative solutions to those problems. I mean, think about the challenge of urban heat, for example. You know, if we're thinking about the city, municipal government, who's responsible for that in your community, right? It might be the parks department, as they think about managing the urban tree canopy, tree planting campaigns, uh, creating really green and verdant open spaces. Maybe they have some splash pads and playgrounds for kids on sort of, you know, extreme heat days. Could be the transportation department, thinking about sort of street design guidelines and how we create more breathable green streets, but also paving standards to get some more reflective pavement that doesn't sort of absorb the heat from the sun all the time. But beyond government, you know, nonprofit and community-based institutions may solve, or may serve as really critical cooling centers uh, during extreme heat days. They may have vital networks with city, uh, city residents who are particularly vulnerable, whether those are seniors or members of you know, communities who are less connected to government. 
the state and utilities, right, they set energy efficiency standards um, and can uh, have sort of energy efficiency incentives for many of us. Private homeowners, private developers can have green roofs, cool roofs, et cetera. Um, so all of these uh, people are part of the problem and it, you know, it forces us to think, who are you bringing to the, to the table as you're advancing your work in communities? You know, silo busting sort of within and across sectors is really critical to develop the transformative solutions we need. And this cross-sectoral work is really hard. I'm not saying that it's easy, especially for government. And I say that as a reform bureaucrat who worked with New York City government for many years. You know, government often views partnerships through really arcane procurement channels, how they buy sort of services or engagements, or through, I mean, I don't know if you've been to public meetings lately, but they can be often very stale, right? And they don't meet residents where they are. But we all need to broker new ways of collaboration, not just government, but we all need to be reaching out in new and different ways so that we don't rely on single sectors or silos alone when, if we're going to really build more sustainable places. And third, you know, this multi-sectoral work also highlights the need to focus on systems, whether human-made or natural. The most urgent challenges we face are complex and at the intersection of many interdependent systems. When you think about flooding, right, we have to think about watersheds, we have to think about stormwater infrastructure and coastal ecosystems. If we're thinking about inequality, right, we might have to think about the housing system, the economy, transportation. We need to be looking at the intersections and the interdependencies of systems because if there are failures in one of those, that has cascading negative impacts for all the others. If you're not taking and talking about other systems into consideration when you're advancing your policy or project or program or engagement, you may be missing out on some really critical vulnerabilities that could cause real harm down the road. Systems thinking also means, though, zooming out on an individual system so that we're seeing the whole picture, you know, because systems don't really honor property and lot, lot lines or municipal jurisdictions. You know, if we're examining sort of a component part of the system in front of us and just looking at like a culvert in an urban watershed, we may be designing solutions that don't fully address the whole problem we're trying to solve. And we may also miss out on opportunities to bring in other actors, other funding, other resources, other ideas, up and down that system that could help us solve the problems we face. You know, taking sort of a systems approach really allows and forces us to look beyond what's right in front of us, whether that's a neighborhood, a community, your house, a city, a region, and consider the upstream and downstream impacts and weaknesses of that system. It also allows you to sort of unlock new ways of creating solutions. This is just an example of a visual from the Los Angeles Resilience Strategy, which we had the privilege of working on a couple of years back. Um, and they were taking a really hard look at the, the LA River, uh, which if any of you have seen the movie Grease, <laughs> that's the LA River, right? That sort of drag racing scene, <laughs> river. It's a concrete um, <laughs> paved over river. And they were you know, really thinking about how could we imagine the river for the 21st century as an asset to all of the resident, all, all of the um, Angelinos. And so they started looking at the interdependent systems that intersect with that river, you know, sort of the city's network of public spaces. How can we make the, how can we view the river as a link with that system? Stormwater capture systems, how could that be public, you know, pulled into both our green and gray infrastructure systems? Biodiversity and habitat preservation, how are we thinking about, you know, migration patterns and sort of the, the range of flora and fauna that we need to really sustain our city? And that also opened up new ways for them to think about the river as a potential asset for new, new solutions. Like, how could some reclaimed space serve to address our a really critical sort of affordable housing crisis? How could it be a driver of economic development, et cetera? Beyond that, this mindset sort of fosters, the systems thinking mindset really fosters and forces a collaborative and collective muscle that then has the potential to advance real systems change work, right? Bringing together multiple systems owners from different departments in diverse sectors can really open up new ways of working together. And then you can really think about how can we transform these systems that just aren't working for our residents. 
And speaking of resonance, the, you know, resilience in practice puts residents first, puts people first in the design and development of solutions by grounding that design in their lived experiences and perspectives. You know, we've seen firsthand through our work here in the US and abroad that municipal governments, no matter where they are, all around the world, really struggle to connect with communities authentically in meaningful ways that establish trust. And that breakdown hinders the kind of transformative and holistic solutions that we need not only to address the crises right in front of us, you know, whether that's COVID or climate related disasters, but also the long term stresses borne by communities that we talked about at the outset, right? Food insecurity, uh, economic insecurity, racial inequity, chronic unemployment. And I think it's important in this mindset to think about community members are not critical stakeholders who need to be engaged, right? You all, and that, that the same goes for you in your municipal government and in your sort of regional government, you're a, 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 a central co-creator to the programs and policies that are intended to benefit all of us. And by sort of thinking about cent, uh, community members as co-creators, you know, we can really ensure that the solutions that we're advancing truly address the complex interdependent lives that they lead, both their challenges, but also build off the unique assets and strengths of residents. You know, around the country, cities are standing up civic design labs and community-centered sort of planning models to help bring resident-centered service and program design principles to their communities. And I think with the influx of federal funding coming to localities, right, the American Rescue Plan Act gave $350 billion to states and localities, uh, the FEMA funding coming to disaster-stricken areas, and of course the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, there's really a once-in-a-generation opportunity, especially for local governments, to reframe how they partner with their residents to design and deliver uh, impactful projects that truly build community resilience and set us on a path to a more equitable recovery. All of us need to challenge ourselves to more intentionally put residents or potential program beneficiaries first uh, when we're advancing the work through our individual portfolios. So I, I could have started with a definition of urban resilience, but I firmly believe that resilience is a very personal and contextualized definition. But when we bring these mindsets together from our work, you know, our core tenant and definition of resilience is the capacity of individuals, communities, businesses, uh, institutions, and systems within a place to survive, adapt, and thrive no matter what kind of risks, stresses, or shocks they might face. And so what could it look like you know, when these mindsets are put into action? How can we bring these practices together uh, in the work that we're advancing day in, day out, whether that means our, our personal or professional work uh, or, the, or, or the work of the Ethical Culture Society here? You know, I want to leave you just with two examples um, of how we're seeing the practice of resilience sort of play out um, across the country here with diverse challenges as entry points and at uh, diverse scales. The first example takes us to the San Diego region in California where, of course, rising sea levels generated by climate change are leading to more frequent and severe coastal flooding extreme precipitation and increased threat of coastal erosion. Um, the region's diverse topography, right, from these high dramatic cliffs in the north sort of down to these low flood-prone flood beaches uh, in the south also reflects or mirrors a real diversity of communities up and down the coast from both an income level uh, perspective, from a density perspective, and from a, you know, a racial and ethnicity perspective. And the coast plays a really critical and central role to the identity of the region. Um, it's a critical economic driver of both the tourism and hospitality sectors. Uh, it's home to you know, San Diego Port, <laughs> a huge naval installation, uh, which all taken together provide really critical employment to huge swaths of the population in the region. For years, uh, climate advocacy groups the dozen or so municipalities up and down the coast, uh, state agencies and other actors have been assessing the challenges there and advancing individual solutions to the system-wide coastal challenge. 
but there was a keen sense that the type of transformational action really necessary to confront all the risks facing the region just wasn't being taken. The sum of all these individual actions, although those were all individually important, were just not rising to the challenge. So you know, we had the privilege of bringing these diverse actors together in partnership with a group called the San Diego Regional Climate Collaborative to both better understand the risks, but also the opportunities to, you know, along this entire coastal system and start to chart some pathways to new solutions. And so in this case, we used erosion as the entry point to the conversation, right? But from there, we worked to uncover all these underlying risks, these stresses that erosion had the potential to exacerbate, like loss of jobs that were vital, especially to lower and middle income communities around the region. Inequitable public access to, to the beaches, who, whose beach is it and who can get there. Uh, shrinking habitat for vital flora and fauna that were critical to the biodiversity of the region. And then by taking a systems view, looking sort of upstream, right, to the, wet, the role of wetlands and watersheds as they sort of flowed down into the coastal ecosystem, but also considering the role of the broader economy, we were able to bring in other key actors, models, and even some potential funding sources. And out of a series of virtual convenings over the summer of 2020, because of course this was COVID, uh, four clear solution pathways emerged, including one focused on the need for really flexible and adaptive financing to actually implement some of these innovative, like so, uh, systems-wide coastal resilience projects. And thus was born the San Diego Future Fund, uh, which will couple really best-in-class research and modeling with multiple funding streams from the public, philanthropic, and private sectors. And this regionally focused fund is going to meet a long-standing need to support the testing and piloting of higher impact cross-jurisdictional uh, solutions that benefit communities more quickly, right? It's kind of flexible funding that you just can't get from state or local or federal government, while also really building capacity at the local level to test and scale new projects. And what's exciting is that we're now sort of scaling this little regional collaborative model in San Diego along with one in Los Angeles that's really centered on wildfires as the entry point to a statewide model called the California Resilience Partnership, which is a multi-year effort to sort of support and drive that sort of regionally focused resilience challenge based effort uh, across the state. And if we go down from the regional scale sort of to the neighborhood, this next example is from Houston. Uh, more specifically in Kashmir Gardens, which is a really vibrant, uh, predominantly African-American neighborhood in the northeast section of Houston. That's home to about 12,000 residents. Um, Kashmir Gardens, uh, when Hurricane Harvey in 2017 unleashed sort of the unprecedented rainfall and flooding event, uh, really it filled all of Houston's creeks and bayous to total capacity, including the hunting bayou, which forms the northern border of the neighborhood in Kashmir Gardens. The northern border is also uh, home to an interstate that cuts off the community from much of the rest of the city and rail yards. You know, so I mean, this is a, a pattern that we see over and over again. Um, but the hunting bayou overflowed, flooding thousands of homes in the neighborhood and forcing residents to flee and evacuate. And it was clear, even though Harvey wasn't the first rainfall flooding event that the, the city had seen or that Kedgeberg Gardens had seen, it was clear from this, from this event that residents were woefully unprepared. There was a lack of community preparedness and it really sparked new conversations between residents and the city to map out a suite of sort of flood resilience projects, right? Including the build out of what's called a resilience hub which is a physical community serving facility that can really support residents with you know, distributing resources and services both right during and in the wake of a natural hazard event. Last winter's devastating winter storms, which left these residents, I mean, we're used to winter storms and cold. Houstonians are not. Last year's winter storms left people without power and water for weeks, weeks, I think about, yeah, it was, it was more than a week. It was 10 days, almost two weeks. And that just underscored this critical need for a resilience hub. So we're actually working with, th through some philanthropic funding, we are working with both the city and an amazing local community-based organization called Northeast Houston Redevelopment Council to really think through the design and implementation of this resilience hub. They call it a lily pad, which will be the first in the city of Houston. Um, and they hope to leverage as a model to expand to other neighborhoods. And so, sort of flood and storm preparedness was definitely the entry point to this work, but 
Northeast NEHRC, Northeast Eastern Redevelopment Council, is really focusing on, hey, that's great, those happen, I mean, we have to be prepared, but what about the 364 other days of the year when we're living here in this neighborhood? And so much of our work is focused on partnering with these community leaders and getting in touch with residents to understand what are these stresses that they want addressed day in, day out, so they're better prepared when a flood does hit. So this is leading to insights around critical gaps in access to healthcare, even though there's a huge, you know, Linda, one of the uh, premier public hospitals right north of the neighborhood, access to healthcare, um, food insecurity is a huge risk, um, and access to sort of job and career training pathways. And sort of this broader vision is really informing the design of the hub, sort of evolving from, yes, a trusted physical site in the neighborhood that can withstand a storm, so it has redundant electrical systems, redundant communication systems, easy, great. But now, how do we bring in an integrated suite of services for the blue sky days, the 364 days of the year, so that this center becomes a trusted place of, of refuge, not only during storms, but uh, in good times? And so this is also, you know, really influencing who's at the table from the city perspective. Because, you know, any of you who have worked in sort of neighborhoods, you know that like the delivery of place-based and neighborhood-based programs is really where all of government silos kind of meet and intersect in the lives of residents. And so to break through these silos, we're really working with the city to bring in this resident uh, and this community leadership around a common driven, uh, resident driven vision for the hub. And really, you know, there's 20 plus agencies at the table and all of them need to sort of align around this vision, agree on what the hub will be to, move, to make this moving forward. So, and a critical outcome of our work, we hope, is that this kind of cross sectoral collaboration capacity that we're fostering here in partnership, I mean, it's not us alone, right? It's the community, it's the city, that that muscle that we're building for the resilience hub is not just a one and done, that it's a capacity that we can find a way to sustain and institutionalize so that it's there for the next disaster, it's there for the next project, and it's, a, it's not a new way, it's just an evolved way of working together to drive some of this work forward. So by focusing on people first, projects, and delivering results for neighborhoods, and the requisite sort of partnerships to sustain this in the long term, our work with Casimir Gardens and Houston really has the potential to transform how that city and the residents are working together. And we're really hoping that this model will expand to other neighborhoods in the city. And we're also hoping to expand that nationally. So I mean, these are just two examples uh, of how applying resilience mindsets can really help catalyze action that addresses some of the interconnected challenges we face. And I think, you know, no matter the, the scale or entry point that, that, that you all might be considering working in, uh, whether that's in our local communities, um, in our places of reflection, um, uh, in, in the workplace, or if you're, you're brave enough to dip your toe into sort of lack local or state or national politics and governance, I think the practice of urban resilience uh, really offers tools and approaches that can empower us, empower us as practitioners, no matter the sector, to really leverage our assets to deliver more integrated solutions for communities. And I think bringing these mindsets into our respective professional and personal practices you know, has the potential to unlock new ways of working together to forge stronger, more inclusive, and resilient places for all. Um, it's been a real pleasure kind of sharing some of this with all of you, and I hope that you'll consider bringing some of these into, into your work, because uh, it's gonna take all of us to build a better future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. That was that was that was a wonderful and inspiring uh, discussion. Uh, is there anybody who has a question? Jesse has a question. Oh, Jess. Here you go. Make it a softball one, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do you guys do differently, you like Caucasian New York City folks, to reach out to this African American neighborhood in Houston that the government, you so rightly called out, does not effectively reach out to? How what? tax do you take that is that are better so i don't know if i don't know if it's better i mean i think if you if you work in community development or you know uh neighborhood development you have to enter into all your spaces very humbly and you have to start from a position of listening you know i mean i i think we view community members as experts you know oftentimes sort of outside consultants are brought in as experts and remunerated appropriately so for their expert but I mean community members are experts and without their insight um, you know 
the projects can't move forward. So we, we often try to level the playing field just in terms of the equitable distribution of resources, right? So our grant from philanthropy includes funding for uh, the community-based organization and ensures that we're paying residents for, you know, remunerating residents for their input. So I think it's a shift in how you think about um, sort of expertise, right? Uh, I also think, <sighs> I mean, and I have, I have empathy for cities, right? They have a lot of different stakeholders to, mention, to, to manage. Um, but I also think it's about meeting residents where they are. So for example, we were collaborating with any Northeast Houston Redevelopment Council um, on a community survey. Community survey is not like new or different, right? It's, everybody does a community survey. Um, but we really sort of hashed it out. Like how do we, what language works in this survey? What doesn't, um, how do we distribute it? Um, so it was a co-created survey we were strategizing around how to get the word out. We knew that there's a lot of senior citizens in the neighborhood, so we can't always get a lot of online uh, responses. So how can we partner and get out at ice cream socials, get out at sort of other events? And then two weeks ago, we were actually down in Houston, and we weren't hearing from a lot of parents, right? Or, or people who were sort of in their 30, 20s, 30s, 40s. And it was through our partnerships with NEHRC that we worked with a principal at a local school to just create sort of an after school activity for kids, right? It was a community engagement, it was a public meeting, but it was a fall, we call it a fall resilience fest. We had four tables set up. We had like a different sort of question from the survey in an interactive boards there. So we were getting input from parents, but at each table we had trick, you know, we had candy for the kids, they were trick or treating. Um, my colleague Corinne was doing crafts with all the kids for like two hours. I was like, doing sidewalk chalk, all of that. And we also had a raffle, right? So parents, you know, if they, if they gave us some input on like a sticky dot board, I did this, well, that picture with the, the mm -hmm. sticky dots, if they gave us some input, they got a raffle ticket. And then we, right. we've right. like raffled off $50 gift cards. So it's like, look, if we're gonna ask you for your time, right. you can, we can't expect you to take time. You have kids to take care of, you have jobs to do. If we're providing, if we're meeting where you where you are and trying to just create spaces where you're building community, I think that's, that's all we can do. But it's not perfect, right? You always have to recognize your privilege and, and walk into those spaces very humbly. Um, you talked about the, the shocks and, uh, and stresses. And, the, uh, and, and we, you know, we wanna build public consciousness and inspire funding and phil philanthropy. The, the media, the major media outlets, they're very good at the shocks. Yes. There's, you know, if it leads, if it bleeds, it leads. And, and so the shocks get a lot of public exposure. Major media outlets, I'm talking about Fox News and, and MSNBC and some online, online sources. But the consequences to individual citizens, which is, should be a follow-up and should get equal amount of exposure, doesn't, doesn't show up on these major media outlets. Yeah. And, I would think it would be necessary to ins inspire the public and, f and you know philanthropic funding. And you talk about silo busting, um, which is you know a very interesting term. I've never heard of it before. But these major media outlets are huge silos. How do we bust through them and get attention and exposure to the consequences of those stresses, not just the stresses itself, which are very dramatic, yeah. and get lots of exposure by itself? That is a that is a million dollar question, Jenna. I mean, I think it's you know, media. I mean, I'm no media expert, but I think media is driven by money, right? And wh who's the eyes on sort of the stories? And so, I I think we have to find a way to communicate in new and different ways about those individual stories that sort of are tied to these larger macro events. And I think that. I mean, we see a lot of, you know, again, uh, my entry point to a lot of this work is municipal government, which is not great necessarily at communicating. But I think one thing that we've seen is through, you know, our, a lot of our resilience work, if you're focused on bringing all these like abstract terms like climate change and, you know, economic disparity and, and, and inequity and all of that into sort of the lives of a, a persona or an individual, that can help a lot with storytelling. So, you know, I think, finding new ways to tell compelling stories of sort of personal resilience and how that relates to overall urban resilience could be compelling. 
But I don't know if that's powerful enough to break through sort of the media industrial complex <laughs> that um, that's there. I mean, I think that that is, that, I wish I had a better answer for that, you know? <laughs> and if anybody does on the lines, let yeah. us know. We, we need that. We need better coverage. We need more equitable coverage. You know, the one thing I will say is that I do think that, you know, what I have seen is uh, private philanthropy playing a role. When I was at the, uh, with uh, 100 Brazilian Cities, you know, the Rockefeller Foundation was funding um, Reuters through a partnership to just explore more topics on resilience, right? And so I think looking to other sectors to sort of fund and create the, the space that goes against market incentives to deliver some of that reporting could be an answer, but I know it's not a very satisfactory one. Can we take a question from Zoom? We have a question from Elaine and Dan. So go ahead, I'm asking you to unmute and I will put you guys on the screen. Oh my goodness, <laughs> is that embarrassing or what? Um, so I, I really appreciate, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I really appreciate your, uh, your talk, <clears throat> excuse me, and the emphasis on, um, and criticality really of systems thinking and of thinking uh, of the whole set of issues uh, that, uh, um are are that, that that govern what a community has to focus on but i wonder if uh that's just a first step and if the hardest problems and often the what what's behind the actual barriers are real differences about what those stresses are or even um situations where one person's stress may be another person's comfort. I'll take an extreme case. Um, the extreme stress of being an enslaved person may be reflected in the extreme comfort of the person of the slaveholder. Um, obviously, we're not talking about that sort of a situation here, but if we look at the ways in which cities are organized and in which power is dispersed in cities, we may well see that the extreme stresses faced by residents of poor neighborhoods who don't have a lot of material resources may directly or indirectly, and not always so indirectly, benefit the residents of wealthier areas who can exploit the cheap labor of the people in the poor neighborhoods. And hence, there may be real differences of, uh, I will say opinion, but let's be more honest and say interest um, in what, in defining those stresses and defining what impacts of what shocks will matter and even defining what systems are worth looking at. And so those which are essentially questions of political struggle are, I would argue often more fundamental and may often constitute the silos and barriers to the kinds of systems thinking that, as you rightly point out, are critical to break through. People may not want to break through those silos because either consciously or otherwise, they know that those silos may protect the interests of their narrow, often privileged group. And I wonder how you come to grips with the, those kinds of issues in your work. Thanks. Thank you. I mean, I think that that's such a, a, a critical question. I mean, one thing that we didn't spend a lot of time talking about today, just because I was trying to be a little bit more broad than just, just cities, although we're clearly talking about cities, is, is political courage and political leadership. I mean, a, a key success factor to, to our work has been, you know, working with elected officials, mayors, others, who are willing to, to address those, those systems and go to the heart of that. I mean, and so I think that has, you know, that, and, and yes, that, that, that means sort of taking honest and open and searing looks at, you know, the past. I mean, I think about when we were working at 100 Brazilian Cities, we had the, we worked with the city of Boston and, and Mayor Marty Walsh. And he was, he, uh, you know, immediately through his um, election was listening to, you know, black residents of Roxbury and Dorchester and re recognized that, 
you know, the legacy of busing in, in Boston had never been fully addressed. They'd never fully reckoned with that. And so he went into his, uh, you know, sort of term and, and for, led a lot of his, his two terms around this issue of racial equity. And so the resilience work that we did in Boston had a specific racial equity focus. And yes, we, we could have gotten there through uh, the work and the methodologies and the frameworks we used, but it was an imperative coming from the mayor there. And so I think you're right. I mean, without sort of political will and political leadership, some of these conversations where entrenched interests are, you know, are, are much more of an uphill battle. Um, but that's also where I think you know, finding allies in sort of an ecosystem of champions from across sectors and pinpointing, you know, uh, the, the sort of courageous actors, not just in City Hall, but in the private sector. Um, you know, you think a lot about Atlanta and the role that the private sector has played in advancing, um, you know, uh, racial justice movements there. You think about um, other cities. I mean, I think it has to be uh, sort of a you know, a, a, almost like a stakeholder mapping and a championing mapping exercise to do that. But I, I completely agree that these silos exist for a reason, not just sort of funding streams, but also because it does protect interests and protect uh, wealth and privilege. We don't have any more questions on Zoom at the moment. So back to the meeting house. Hi, I have more of a comment than a, than a question. Um, I want to comment on the, uh, the, the, the power of uh, grassroots organizing in this particular situation. I don't know if you're aware, but in Teaneck this year, uh, an um, organization was formed, uh, a grassroots organization that started with me and one other individual, um, and uh, grew exponentially across all demographic groups to get an initiative on the ballot here in Teaneck to require the town uh, and all the homeowners in town to, to engage in community choice aggregation, which uh, would bring renewable energy uh, to the town. Um, and um, we started uh, with a group, a small group of people. And because this was a really great idea to fight climate change, it grew and grew and grew into an organization of more than over 100 volunteers uh, by the time we got this on the ballot and against opposition from the Township Council, which surprisingly didn't want to fight climate change in this way, uh, we were able to get this on the, on the uh, ballot, even after a court battle to get on the ballot, and it passed uh, more than two to one. Uh, so when you have a good idea, and when you have a grassroots organization that you can start, every individual in this room can have a good idea and get his neighbors and other uh, parts of the, of the community to join with you to start a, a grassroots organization uh, for some of these things. And uh, now we're looking into combining our efforts with uh, other towns in the area that have passed the same community choice aggregation like right. Leonia and Glen Rock to make an even more powerful organization. So uh, I just wanted to comment on, you know, it's, it, it starts with you sometimes. Just, yeah. just, just do it. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, Great. Great. <laughs> Great. Hi, great, thanks. So I'm, I'm going to um, just share a little bit of news that uh, I heard the other day that kind of is a maybe an or organic example of the type of thing that you're talking about. Um, and uh, it came to me from our friend Nieves Pimienta, who uh, I think uh, has been a member of the Ethical Culture Society, and this was for an Essex Hudson Greenway. And I think uh, this is a, a piece of property that's owned by a railroad um, boo, uh, sorry. Um, it's owned by a railroad, right? But then they want to sell it, and they're, but, but there's also this community effort to turn it into uh, something like a, a high line here. Um, and I know Nieves was working through an extension uh, with Rutgers University to try to build um, local support, in particular, for this greenway. So there you have the academia, uh, and uh, again, private or uh, public funding. Uh, philanthropic, philanthropic funding. Um, she reached out to me. I sent her over to talk to Janet Glass because <laughs> Janet is working with Green Faith, mm -hmm. which is a CBO uh, that br brings different churches together to support environmental uh, projects or, you know, just again, environmental initiatives. Uh, there had been resistance on the part of the state government. Um, but I think yesterday, I don't know if anybody heard, but yesterday Governor Phil Murphy said that they're going to fund 
the Greenway, the right. Essex Hudson Greenway. So that's right. a really wonderful thing, you know? And uh, again, so I mean, the, the kind of thing that you're talking, this is nine miles that otherwise would be kind of chopped into little pieces and some of it that's developed cool. and some of it gone to, you know, desuetude. So here they've really like pulled a lot of these resources together organically to get it over the finish line. And I'm really like so proud for the little part that you know we've taken as the Ethical Culture Society, and of course Janet always like on the forefront over there. So that's a, just a great thing I wanted to mention as an example of what you're talking about. Now my question, I'm finally going to get to it. <laughs> um, one of the silos that I see oftentimes is between urban and suburban mm -hmm. yeah. uh, environments and communities. Yeah. Um, and you know there's plenty to do here in suburbia, but my question is how do we sort of bridge that? gaps so that we can really get outside of what is that particular type of silo. Yeah. So I'd be question, uh, interested in your thoughts on that. Thank I mean, you. I think there are, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. And I think on, just on the Essex Hudson Greenway, I mean, I think that's an amazing opportunity, right? And how can, you know, how can that as leveraging that new asset, right? That now, I, is it state ownership, right? I mean, how can they think about the using that asset to address all these different shocks and stresses that those communities along that greenway face, right? I mean, I think that's a that's a that's a great opportunity. I mean, one of the reasons that we're so excited about resilient cities catalyst is because yes, we work with cities, but we also we recognize during our work at 100 resilient cities that like regions are so important. And so I think, you know, the the sort of certain issues lend themselves to a lot of ur urban suburban sort of collaboration, transportation, um, the economy, but also sort of watersheds and all of that. And so I think, you know, in terms of the, the sort of divide, I don't know if we're going to solve for, you know, the vested interests of individual boroughs and sort of the vested interest that is New York City, right, in, in the room here. But I think that um, having a deep appreciation and, and better understanding sort of the mutual dependencies of these two spaces on each other. I mean, New York needs um, the, the, the wonderful the people who live here in, in Teaneck, the people who live in Bergen County. Many of them live and work in New York. They rely on that for time. I mean, anybody who lives in New Jersey and works in New York, you know, they're relying mm -hmm. on you. Um, and, and, and sort of as a mutual dependency there, I think organizations like the Regional Plan Association are great to be able to sort of foster that space where some creative um, urban and peri-urban uh, sort of work can be done. But I think the real barrier that comes up against that is, you, I mean, it, this is where the political lines and the funding streams really do put in real barriers. I think, you know, you think about Port Authority, right? That's a bi-state sort of authority that can address some sort of transit issues and things like that. But, you know, I think, it's really thinking through how you can, uh, what issues are the entry points to some of that to foster sort of more collaboration there and, and then where do you need to fight to really uh, move on to other issues. There are, are there any other questions on this end? Okay, well let's give a hand once again to Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was really terrific and in inspirational. I mean, I'm I'm in this um, world too, although I'm deep in a, in a, in, a, in the housing silo, and the funding streams are so calcified and so encrusted, and it, it speaks to all these questions about how you how you how you reorganize cities and how we, and I think we really do have to reorganize our thinking about cities and suburbs. We have to bring more. I, I hate to say density to suburbs, but that's certainly part of the, pro the housing challenge. I know it certainly is true on the West Coast, but it's true here too. And it's an interesting, uh, very tough set of challenges that you're right in the middle of and thinking about really creatively, and I really appreciate that. To learn more about us, visit our website, ethicalfocus.org, or email us at admin at ethicalfocus.org and we'll get back to you. To make a donation, go to ethicalfocus.org slash donate. Please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and you can watch many of our past programs on our YouTube channel.